that's the way. Just go to the middle. Oh no, I started this one. Oh, no. oh you did it. Okay. Oh. Hey, you get the lights good? Yeah. Okay. Oh, here we go. Oh, oh, oh. Should we go? Who's that? Raul. Oh, oh yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, am I on mute? Can you help you? Yeah. Perfect. Can you get that? You want to go right now? All right. All right. So uh, we'll get started. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Everyone gets a chance to gnosticate. <laughs> um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy Friday. Today I'm going to be presenting a physical exam. Um, so we'll, we'll start with the vital signs, um, you know, obviously blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, um, often and more importantly in hospital with desaturation, temperature, and I included weight and BMI in this as well. Um, I think especially for cardiovascular patients, uh, critically important to keep track of this, um, you know, uh, modifiable risk factors and then as well as if um, certain patients uh, are losing weight unintentionally, it's something that we should keep track of as well, very important. Um, something that I seem to run into in the office setting a lot is uh, with blood pressure. It being elevated and um, you know having to redo it. So it, it's uh, always good practice to kind of to do the blood, take the blood pressure for a patient uh, the appropriate way, kind of give them like five minutes or so to settle down in a nice quiet setting. Always give them support for their arm at the level of the heart. Uh, inflate the cuff to about 30 millimeters above um, uh, you know where you lose the radial pulse uh, and then slowly come down um, and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, so that's basically it for that. So next, um, talk about general appearance, um, briefly, um, things you want to look at for patients and, you know, if they're in any kind of distress, if they're diaphoretic, tachypnic, cyanosis, pallor, um, especially important in our patient population, posture, uh, orthopnea, as well as a uh, platypnea, which is a uh, desaturation or dyspnea when the patient actually, uh, is seated up rather than supine. Um, you can see this in any kind of conditions that, that uh, will have a right to left shunt. Um, patients with liver, liver cirrhosis, as well as some people with PFOs and ASDs. And uh, trypopnea, which is uh, um, dyspnea and uh, oxygen desaturation when the patient is lying on one side rather than the other. And this is seen in patients with large pleural effusions. Other things to make note of is their nutritional status. Um, patients who are obese, you know, it, it can confer lots of uh, pathological conditions, sleep apnea, metabolic syndrome. Patients who are tachectic, especially in end-stage heart failure. And then athletic and muscular patients is important because it can change some of your physical exam findings. Uh, so next we'll move on to the neck exam, which includes jugular venous pressure and pulsation, and as well as the carotid pulsation. So very briefly, the jugular venous pressure, uh, JVP, is essentially the uh, point at which you will see the highest oscillation, or also referred to as the meniscus. Uh, of the jugular venous uh, pulsations. And in patients who are hypovolemic, um, you may not see a, a JVP as a, easily. Um, it's a, you know, assumed to be low, and you may actually need to lower the head of the bed, sometimes even lay them supine in order to see it. Uh, and in patients who are volume overloaded, like many of our patients, um, you'd expect the JVP to be elevated, and subsequently, you know, sometimes you may even need to raise their, the head of the bed even higher than um, you know, we normally do. So here we have a diagram of just, you know, sort of how to measure JVP. Um, here we have a patient lying 45 degrees, which is generally, you know, the, where you want to start. Um, you can use a pillow in the back of their head to kind of relax their sternocleidomastoid muscles if it helps um, better visualize. 
You can also use tangent, tangential lighting uh, as well. You want to find that highest point. Um, use a rectangular object, a straight object, um, horizontally, and then align that with a ruler with centimeters on it uh, at the sternal angle or the angle of Louis. Uh, find the point where they cross, and whatever that centimeter marker is, whatever that number is, you add five to it because, uh, as shown on this diagram, the sternal angle is about five centimeters from the RA, uh, and that'll give you your uh, JVP. And in a normal healthy individual, uh, JVP uh, of about eight is your upper limit. So anything above that is uh, abnormal. Uh, another important thing to look for for the JVP is an inspiratory collapse. So in a normal person without any pathology, you expect their JVP, wherever you do measure it at, to uh, collapse with inspiration. So other things that you look for while inspecting the JVP, the hepatojugular reflex, also known as the abdominal jugular, jugular reflex. Um, important to note, you know, uh, it's called a hepatojugular reflex, but you don't actually need to, to press on the liver itself. Um, I think a better term is probably the abdominal jugular reflex because you can really apply pressure anywhere. Um, peri umbilical works just fine. Uh, and uh, you essentially what you're doing is you're treating an intra, increased intra-abdominal pressure, which then relates to increased flow into the thorax, increased preload into the heart. And um, what you're looking for is an increase in your JVP greater than three centimeters, so four centimeters or above, and uh, that should be sustained for 10 seconds. Uh, and that is a um, positive hepatojugular reflex. And what that indicates is that you have decreased RV compliance, and uh, it can be used as a surrogate for LVEDP, and um, you can say that it's greater than 15. The uh, other finding you can look for is uh, a small sign, which Greg touched on yesterday during his lecture, um, just briefly. Um, this is when, you know, uh, in cases like constrictive pericarditis or restrictive cardiomyopathy, uh, RV infarcts, where you don't have that same compliance with the RV. Um, with inspiration, what you have is a decrease in your intrathoracic pressure, which allows greater flow of blood into the thorax. Um, at the same time, in a normal person, you would have greater expansion of the RV and greater filling. So with inspiration in a normal person, you'd expect your JVP to drop. But if you have one of these conditions, you don't have that same filling of the RV, but you still have the increase in blood flow into the thorax. So what you'll actually have with inspiration is an increase in the JVP, thus the small sign. Um, and uh, this is, a, again, briefly, we've covered this in multiple previous topics, but it, important for us to kind of reiterate uh, the jugular venous pulsations themselves in the various waves and the descents that we're looking at here. Um, you know, the A wave, uh, it, it corresponds to, uh, in this case, when you're looking at the JVP, it corresponds to the right atrial uh, contraction, and you have your X descent. Um, and uh, there's the C wave there, which corresponds to the tricuspid valve closing. Um, and then your V wave, which corresponds to the ventricular systole or increase in ventricular pressure. And then your X descent, which corresponds to passive uh, filling of the atrium and dropping pressure there. Um, and important to note, um, some of the pathological conditions that can change this. Um, most commonly we'll see in AFib, what you'll have is a loss of the A wave because there's no atrial contractions. Um, in any kind of AV dissociation, you'll have what is known as canon A waves. Um, so you'll just see, you know, pretty prominent A waves and that's because you have your right atrium um, contracting against a closed tricuspid valve because of the AV disynchrony. Um, and then uh, in cases of uh, tricuspid stenosis, RVH, pulmonary hypertension, anything that increases your RV pressures, you're going to have larger A waves because, again, your right atrium has to push against a higher pressure. Um, severe TR can lead to large V waves. Um, constrictive pericarditis, restrictive cardiomyopathy, I already mentioned um, earlier about small sign, but also you'll see more prominent X and Y descents. And, um, when you compare that to tamponade, you'll have a more prominent X descent, whereas you'll lose your Y descent in tamponade. It's important to realize, <clears throat> probably the biggest surprise for me when I took this course mm -hmm. was how many questions are asked in this course. Mm -hmm. It's just something you don't expect. But so I'm just telling you now, like, you need to know this backwards and forwards, and particularly the JVP. Mm -hmm. Often it's not a direct question, but what they do is they embed the physical exam into the question. So you have to know the physical exam in order to get the kind of answer or something that you can trust me on this. You guys need to know this. It's not this 
this is what? You know, is there going to be so many questions on the board that the host is asking? It's actually like all the questions. Definitely <laughs> is not exaggerated. I took my like a two year research earlier this year, and the only thing I didn't study, I'm embarrassed to say, I'm sorry, John Musicaya, I did not study the physical. I studied everything else, pressure volume, drug drug interactions. I made a book for myself about all the things I need to study, and I didn't do well. I mean, so I didn't know the physical thing. So you really have to know, even for the research, it'll never, never, never go away. It's just shocking that that's the shocking. Mm -hmm. They want to know how many milliseconds, you know, after you inflict it, you know, that you're not level, how can you really inflict it? And how, that's what they're going to get in question. Can be on the second you're a, a point for the second. Mm -hmm. Like that's the level that they're wanting. Mm -hmm. uh, so for us, um, you know, to, to look at the JP and to, to, to tell the difference between these different waves can be obviously very difficult. Uh, one of the ways that it can be made easier is if you actually listen to the heart at the same time you're evaluating the JVP, uh, listen for S1 and S2 and, and look at how they correspond to the waves here in order to kind of um, better visualize it and then try to figure out if there's any abnormalities that are present. Um, you know, S1 corresponds to, to the closure of uh, the mitral valve and the triclastic valve and uh, is uh, going to be a little bit more prominent in the mitral area, the apex, and uh, in the left lower sternal border, whereas S2 corresponds to the closure of the aortic and pulmonic valves, and so you'll expect to hear that a little bit louder in your second intercostal space um, on the right and left uh, sternal border. So using that information, you, you can figure out S1, S2, and then look at the JVP at the same time to kind of assess you know, what's going on there. <laughs> And uh, another obviously important thing is to differentiate between the JVP and the carotid pulsations. Um, not always easy, but there's some very, you know, sort of uh, good things that you can look at to differentiate. Um, the JVP is rarely palpable and easily, easily compressible, whereas the carotid pulsation is obviously not. It's, you, you know, you can palpate it very easily and, and you usually can't uh, extinguish it. Um, and for each cardiac cycle, you expect to see one upstroke and descent in the, in the carotid pulsation, whereas you'll see these two more prominent waves in the uh, pulsation of the JVP. Um, and then, you know, what we spoke about earlier, the height of the column of the JVP does uh, fluctuate with the position of the head. Um, and then, you know, if you uh, elicit the abdominal jugular reflex, uh, you can see a change with JVP, but you will not with carotid. And then, um, obviously, the respiratory variations as well, which are seen with JVP and not carotid. So delving more into the carotid pulsation a little bit, um, it's best usually felt just medially to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, and uh, some of the things that you want to evaluate, the amplitude of the pulse, um, and this correlates pretty well with the pulse pressure, just something to know. The contour of the pulse wave, um, you know, you want to know the speed of the upstroke, how long the summit is, and the speed of the downstroke. In a normal person, you're going to have a brisk upstroke, smooth and rapid, and it will always follow the S1. Um, almost immediately. Uh, the summit will be smooth as well. And then the downstroke will be pretty brisk as well, but it will be less abrupt than the, than the upstroke was. Uh, another important thing to look for is variations in amplitude, um, either from beat to beat or with respiration. Um, some pathological states, you know, if you, if you feel like small, thready, or weak pulse, you can expect to see that in someone with cardiogenic shock. Uh, bounding pulse, you expect to see that in someone with aortic insufficiency. Um, delayed pulse uh, in someone with aortic stenosis. And then what I mentioned with the variations in amplitude, um, pulses alternates, which you can, you can see in uh, someone with uh, uh, low output states, um, and then also a paradoxical pulse as well. Um, another thing to also look for is thrills and, and bruises. So thrills you palpate, and uh, a thrill essentially is just uh, uh, palpable vibrations from a murmur, and uh, bruises are um, something that you auscultate, and they essentially represent stenosis or narrowing of a vessel. Oh. Tortuous, okay. Um, and here I just have a couple of examples of the waveforms that you'd expect to see in a, in a carotid pulsation. A being normal, and as you can see, that brisk upstroke, the slightly less brisk downstroke there, smooth um, summit there. Hyperdynamic state here, you can expect to see this in someone with like hyperthyroidism or anemia. Um, and then full, Parvus and TARDIS, again, this is the type of pulse you expect to see with someone with aortic stenosis. 
pulses alternans again, same patient with a low output state. Pulses, uh, by friends, um, essentially, uh, you're going to be seeing this. It, it, it's like two systolic peaks. Um, and you expect to see this in someone with uh, aortic regurgitation, the first peak being actual systolic flow, and then the second peak is a sort of a rebound uh, effect um, that you're picking up in the peripheral pulse. Um, uh, Dichrotic pulse, uh, this is, again, another sort of double peak pulse. Um, you see this in low output states as well. And then the typical sp <clears throat> spike in dome shape that you see in Holcomb. So initial spike is the initial outward flow from the aortic valve, and then um, what you'll have is because of the negative pressure, you'll have a SAM or systolic anterior motion of the micro valve, which will kind of close that off. And then with the increased pressure, it'll open again and cause this sort of second bump that you'll see, which is the dome. Uh, so next we'll move on to the heart exam. Um, the first thing we're gonna talk about is the uh, point of maximal impulse, which is usually the apical impulse. Uh, and I say usually is because uh, it's not always, uh, sometimes, um, if you have a very enlarged right ventricle, dilated pulmonary artery, or even an aneurysm of the uh, aorta, those can actually create a uh, point of maximal impulse greater than the apical impulse. Um, it's always important to inspect the chest first to see if you can actually see the pulsation. Again, you can use tangential lighting. Um, and then you want to palpate as well using the full hand, the palmar surface, and then make finer assessments with the fingers. Uh, if you're having some difficulty uh, finding the PMI, you can always ask the patient to exhale and hold their breath. Um, you can also try um, placing the patient in the left lateral decubitus position, which can sometimes help as well bring the, the, the heart closer to the chest wall. You'll have some difficulty in patients who might be obese. Again, very muscular chest wall um, can make this uh, difficult as well. If they have a large anterior posterior diameter, like someone with COPD. Um, and then uh, with women, of course, with their breasts, sometimes you'll have to uh, move the breasts as well to try and find this. Um, qualities of the PMI that are important, location. We'll measure this either from the mid-sternal or mid-clavicular line, and uh, you also have to identify the rib area. In most healthy individuals, it'll fall somewhere close to the mid-clavicular line, around the fourth or fifth rib space. For diameter, in a normal healthy person, you, you expect to see a less than three centimeter uh, diameter. Again, when you place the person in the left lateral decubitus position, you expect this diameter to increase slightly, so there's just something to know. Uh, amplitude, usually, you know, it's, you'll feel very brisk, almost like a tapping sensation. Um, in younger people, especially if they're very athletic, and uh, also if they're very anxious, you may expect to see a higher amplitude with the PMI. Um, but if they are, in fact, healthy, um, the duration should remain the same. And then you can also expect to see a higher amplitude. Patients where hyperthyroid or anemia states, or if they have uh, LV pressure or volume overload states as well. And uh, the duration for a normal, healthy uh, individual, you'll expect to occupy about the two thirds, first two thirds of the of, uh, of systole or less. Um, so next, we'll talk about heaves, lifts, and uh, thrills. So a heave or a lift is just a palpable uh, uh, impulse that'll lift your hand. That's the name lift. Um, and it's associated with ventricular pressure or volume overload. So uh, obviously, if you're looking for right ventricular heaves or left ventricular heaves, and a, a thrill is just, a, again, something that you can palpate. It's a vibratory sensation, and it comes from a murmur. So for thrills, you want to obviously palpate in the areas of where you would expect to hear the murmurs in the aortic, harmonic, tricuspid, and, and apical region. Um, Uh, and a quick diagram here, um, just kind of, you know, when you're assessing these things, when you're looking for a heave or a lift, um, it's always best to use sort of, you know, that your hand there, um, the base, the hand, and then uh, for thrills, you can use the padding here. And then once you find it, find that area, you can localize these pulsations as well as the PMI using the, the pads of the fingers. Uh, and just a couple of just quick notes um, on these things. So LVH um, will result in an apical impulse. Um, again, sustained, but not diffuse. So uh, it's sustained for longer than two-thirds of systole, uh, but it's not going to be diffuse. Hence, you're, you're not expecting the LV to uh, you know, dilate. Um, whereas if you have LV enlargement from like dilated cardiomyopathy, you expect more of a diffuse um, PMI and often will have laterally and sometimes even um, uh, inferiorly displaced apical impulse. Um, and then conversely, RVH as well as pulmonary hypertension can result in a left parasternal heave 
or left, again, sustained, but not diffuse. And then if you have RV enlargement, again, diffuse. Um, and uh, hokum can actually cause a double or triple atypical impulse. Um, the reason for this is that, the, that there's actually, because of the increase in the pressure that the left atrium has to uh, generate uh, in hokum, you actually are, you can feel the, the palpable sort of A wave, the, the apical impulse or apical system. So that's that double. And then triple is sometimes where you actually feel two ventricular impulses in addition to the left uh, atrial impulse as well. Uh, so next we'll talk a little bit uh, about um, auscultation. First, I just want to quickly go over diaphragm, bell, and then tunable stethoscopes. Um, so the diaphragm, you know, um, for people that have a, a stethoscope that's not tunable and it has a separate diaphragm and bell, obviously the diaphragm is the, the larger of the two. And it's better for picking up high-pitched sounds, which include S1 and S2, most murmurs as well, uh, pericardial friction rub as well. And, um, you, you know, you're going to use it to listen almost throughout the entire uh, uh, precordium and you'll place this firmly against, against the chest. In contrast to the bell, the smaller of the two, um, it's sensitive to low pitch sound, which includes S3 and S4, um, and then also the my, uh, murmur of microstenosis, and you'll generally want to place the bell lightly. Um, there are some tunable stethoscopes, um, and these just include one uh, auscultating surface. So with these, you kind of just have to apply light pressure, and that'll kind of mimic what the bell does. And then when you apply more firm pressure, you're able to hear more high pitch sounds, and it'll mimic what the diaphragm does. Um, one kind of cool thing about the bell, though, um, you know, if you're, let's say you're trying to listen for an S3, and you think you hear, but you're not really sure, you're applying light pressure with the bell, what you can actually do is you can apply more firm pressure, and it'll sort of mimic the diaphragm, and the S3 will disappear. Uh, and then that can sort of confirm your suspicions about it being an S3. So in that way, it can be pretty helpful. Uh, here, just a quick diagram, just showing you know the areas that we auscultate for the various valves and where those valves actually are in relation to the uh, anatomy of the heart. Here, um, it's, it's pretty much it for this, but you know, important to note, um, a lot of this is just transmitted noise um, in, in the way that the blood will flow. And very quickly, special positions as well. So one is, you know, sitting up and leaning forward. Um, you'll ask the patient to exhale and hold their breath when you're doing this. And you can accentuate certain aortic murmurs, um, especially the soft murmur of aortic regurgitation, which is often missed, it's not done in this position. You can also use this position to help uh, listen for pericardial friction rub. And you use a diaphragm in this position, the left sternal border, that's sort of the best way to do it. Um, important note about pericardial friction rub, uh, it's like a high pitched scratchy sound um, associated with pericarditis. And you can actually hear two or even three separate sounds during ventricular systole, ventricular diastole, and atrial systole for that. Um, and then the other position is a left lateral decubitus position. Um, and this brings the LV closer to the chest wall. Um, and, you know, in addition to helping with being able to palpate the PMI, you can also help, uh, help to better evaluate S3, S4, and microstenosis. Uh, and for this, you'll use the bell. Again, the bell, remember, like I mentioned on the last slide, is better for S3, S4, and microstenosis. So uh, first, we'll talk about S1. Um, so this is just when ventricular systole begins, and it corresponds to mitral and tricuspid valves closing, like I mentioned earlier. And I sort of already mentioned this, but S1 is generally louder at the apex and the left lower sternal border than, than S2 is because of what it, what it represents. Um, and the intensity of S1 can increase if, uh, if you have a short PR um, or if you have a mitral stenosis, uh, especially actually only with, with mobile leaflets. If you don't have mobile leaflets, you won't really have uh, an increased intensity of S1. Uh, and a hyperdynamic LV function or even the transvalvular flow due to shunts or increase in, in transvalvular flow due to shunts will increase the force of the leaflet closure and tricuspid stenosis for the same reasons as mitral stenosis. And inversely, the intensity will decrease if you have long PR, um, mitral stenosis with immobile leaflets or even prolapse and then low output states as well. And then S2 corresponds to the end of ventricular systole and the, the closure of the aortic and pulmonic valves and therefore you will hear it more in the right and left sec um, second intercostal spaces parasternally. Um, and uh, you know, again, use the diaphragm to hear it better. The intensity changes um, with uh, A2 component increasing with hypertension or dilated aorta, 
and decreasing with aortic stenosis and the P2 component increasing again, the same kind of concept just on the right side of the heart, pulmonary hypertension and dilated pulmonary artery cause an increase and uh, decrease uh, when you have pulmonary stenosis. And then once you establish S1 and S2, you always want to obviously listen for the, the rate and the rhythm just to make sure that you know, the rhythm is regular and, and everything. Uh, here I, I go over S2 a little bit in, in the splitting that you're, you're going to be seeing. So uh, normal split here um, during expiration, it's, you know, they're, they're occurring at the same time. So you just hear the one sound. But during inspiration, you expect to hear A2 a little bit sooner than, than P2. Um, and then you can have some splitting, pathological splitting that occurs. Um, persistent uh, essentially means that, that that split that you had where A2 comes before P2 is present throughout the entire cardiac cycle uh, during inspiration and expiration, uh, but it's not fixed. It'll still fluctuate. And then with fixed, uh, you'll have that split occurring A2, P2, but it'll be fixed throughout uh, during inspiration and expiration. And then with paradoxical, um, essentially what you have is during inspiration, you will have just one S2, and then during expiration, your A2 will actually follow with P2. So certain pathological states, so with the persistent um, splitting, uh, you can expect to see this anytime you have a delay in P2 or an early A2. So a delay in P2 can occur if you have a right bundle branch block or pulmonary hypertension, RV dysfunction of some kind, um, you know, uh, pulmonic stenosis as well can do it. And uh, early A2, you expect to see in something like severe MR or BSD, uh, and also in Wolf Parkinson White if you have LV pre-excitation. Um, for fixed splitting, the most common example and the classic example that we always see is ASD. Um, but you can also kind of, you can see this kind of in, in RV failure as well, um, and sometimes in a VSD um, with left to right shunts. And then for paradoxical splitting, essentially this really uh, means you know that either the A2 component is delayed or the P2 component is early. And the A2 component being delayed can happen in uh, a few different things, left bundle branch block, uh, RV pacing as well, uh, aortic stenosis, LV dysfunction, hokum. And then uh, P2 early is uh, gonna be in uh, WPW where you have RV pre-excitation. So uh, next we'll talk a little bit about S3. So this can be a physiological sound that you can see in young adults. Um, and uh, usually with, with those, sometimes it'll disappear with standing. Um, and usually about after age 40, most people will lose the, the physiological S3. And uh, during the third trimester of pregnancy, you can see it as well. Um, again, the bell of the stethoscope with light pressure and the left lateral decubitus area is the best place to listen for it. And um, you'll see this in conditions that cause high flow across an AV valve. And important to remember, if you have mitral stenosis, you're unlikely to hear an S2. So S4 is usually pathologic, also known as atrial gallop. Um, and again, the bell, left lateral cubitus. Um, and then this is associated with a, a few different pathological states, uh, namely uh, aortic stenosis, hypertension, hokum, ischemic heart disease. And, and again, uh, in atrial fibrillation, you will not hear an S4. If you have a patient who's tachycardic or if they have a prolonged PR interval, sometimes what you can have is the S3 and S4 components will be combined and it's called a summation gallop. So just something to note. So here I have various sounds that can occur during diastole. Um, to hear OS is an opening snap. Um, and so what you expect, and this is the earliest sound that you'd expect to hear in diastole. And it's generally created when you have mitral stenosis. Um, and the mitral leaflets, um, or actually you can also have an intracuspid stenosis, but essentially the leaflets themselves are causing this uh, high pitch sound as well. Um, and uh, the TP is uh, also occurring at the same time as the opening snap, it's a tumor plop. And this is something that you'd expect to hear in a patient that has a myxoma. Uh, the PK uh, is gonna stand for pericardial knock. And uh, this is best heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope, um, and it can vary with respiration. You'll see this in patients with constricted pericarditis, and essentially what it is is due to rapid early uh, left ventricular filling that occurs. And then SG just stands for the summation gallop, as you can imagine, if S4 and S3 are sort of combined into the summation gallop there. Um, next here are some sounds that you might uh, uh, hear during systole. ES sound stands for ejection sound. Um, and this is something that you typically will hear if you have a bicuspid uh, aortic valve. 
for bicuspid um, demonic valve. Uh, happen early in systole. And then MC and LC are both non ejection sounds, um, mid systolic flick or late systolic flick. And these uh, are associated with uh, mitral valve collapse and tensing of the chordae. Uh, and then uh, once you have that sort of click, you'll also be followed by a murmur. And that murmur represents the, the mitral regurgitation that occurs after the, the valve collapse. Uh, so next we'll get into heart murmurs. Um, you know, just generally murmurs are, are mm -hmm. It is. I mean, it's where it happens. Can you hear us one? Can you hear us one? Can you hear us one? Yeah, so the, the, the murmur, you know, the, the regurgitation doesn't start until the, the valve actually it closes, but then it, it collapses. Mm -hmm. And then the murmur kind of kicks in, right? It takes a little time. For the regurgitation to occur, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why, when you judge the severity, actually the volume is not that high. Because it's not there in the entire system, it's only there in small parts. So if you actually did like a, a, a volumetric assessment, it's actually not that great, even though it would be pretty bad as far as the, the, the volume goes. Um, but that's why it's the, the murmur, it, it, it's really quite, when you really listen, it's quite remarkable. You'll once you once you sort of pay attention, it's really dramatic. You'll, you'll hear S1, a little bit of delay, and then you hear you won't hear it, it's off the mark, you hear the click and the mark. But you'll notice that there is a time delay. And that's the that's one of the distinctions. Mm -hmm. Um so just generally murmurs, um uh, they occur because of turbulent flow. Um, due to some sort of structural abnormality or an increase in blood vo uh, flow velocity itself. Um, and, you know, we'll characterize them in, in a, a few different ways, but mainly the timing, systole, diastole, or, or continuous, and even like early systolic, mid systolic, or late, and um, the clinical significance, whether they're benign or pathologic. Um, in general, ejection systolic murmurs. Um, which are, you know, your aortic stenosis and pulmonic stenosis are diamond shaped and they're usually lower medium frequency. Whereas regurgitant systolic murmurs, um, which are going to be your MR and TR and your BSD, are going to be hollow systolic and high frequency murmurs. Uh, and here we uh, just uh, have the grading uh, for these murmurs and it's graded from one to six, uh, one being very soft murmurs. Um, you may only be able to hear them under completely quiet conditions um, and progressively to get louder. And then uh, once you hit four, these murmurs are going to be associated with a palpable thrill. And then uh, with six, you know, you're going to be able to hear these murmurs even without using the, the stethoscope itself. Just, you know, five, ten millimeters from the chest wall itself, you, you should be able to hear these. And uh, just to note, diastolic murmurs only graded to grade four. Other qualities that we look at, the pitch, um, high, medium, low, uh, the quality of it, um, whether it's blowing, harsh, grumbling, or musical. And then other characteristics, um, you know, does it change with respiration, the position of the patient, and these special maneuvers, which we'll, we'll all go over that uh, a little bit later. First, quickly, to just touch on a couple of innocent and physiologic murmurs. So the innocent murmurs, um, again, from turbulent blood flow, but usually these are um, from the LV ejection of blood into the aorta, sometimes from the RV ejection. 
Um, these patients will have no evidence of cardiovascular disease and, and they won't have evidence of these sort of um, markers of pathology like um, abnormal splitting of S2, any kind of ejection sounds, um, no palpable uh, heaves or lifts um, denoting ventricular enlargement, and then um, these, are, these are not going to be diastolic murmurs by definition. Um, mostly seen in young or adolescent people, but even some elderly patients can have these as well. And then physiologic murmurs are those that are created by that increase in blood flow. Uh, usually it's temporary and uh, it's seen most commonly in conditions like anemia, hypothyroidism, uh, pregnancy, fever. Uh, here I have some murmurs here. We're going to first talk about systolic. So the, the aortic stenosis fulcum, I think probably more commonly tested ones, pulmonic stenosis, micro regurgitation, very important. Uh, Tricuspid regurgitation, uh, BSD. Um, I have mitral valve prolapse here it's written separately, but essentially kind of it, it, it tied in with micro regurgitation. Um, ASD, I'll delve into a little bit. It, it does create a systolic murmur. And that PDA I just added here, it's systolic and that it's a continuous murmur. Um, and we'll quickly just sort of touch on that as well. So uh, yeah, Eric stenosis, a lot to talk about here. Um, again, uh, best heard with the diaphragm at the aortic area, the second intercostal space, uh, upper right tone border, mainly harsh, medium pitch, um, crescendo, decrescendo, like Dr. Hyman mentioned earlier. Um, one important thing to note though, in elderly patients, you can actually also hear a musical murmur um, radiating to the apex, and this is called the Gallivorden murmur. Um, and oftentimes it can be difficult to differentiate this from MR. The, the reason that this happens is postulated that um, basically you have a dissociation. There's two components to the aortic stenosis murmur. There's a harsh component and a musical component. The harsh component occurs um, because of uh, sound transmission through the blood, where the musical component happens through soft tissue. So what you have is um, when the, there's this turbulent flow through the ascending aorta, you'll have um, the harsh component that you can hear in the right upper sternal border. And then the musical component will get transmitted through soft tissue to the mitral area. And that'll be more of a musical um, murmur that you'll hear. And one of the ways that you can differentiate with MR is that this murmur will never radiate to the axilla, whereas the MR murmur may uh, radiate to the uh, axilla. Um, and then, uh, oh, and then for just a normal uh, aortic stenosis again, radiation to the next. So always want to listen to the carotid as well. Uh, and then again, in the elderly, you can have it radiate toward the apex, but never beyond. Intensity, um, it's actually related to the stroke volume and severity. So, you know, um, and I talk about that a little bit in severity here. So when you, when you hear a loud murmur, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's a, a worse stenosis. Um, really that, that peak is, is what you want to look for. So the later the peak is occurring, the more severe of a, of a um, murmur you're, or a stenosis that you're expecting. And uh, a lot of associated findings with the aortic stenosis, the, the sort of harvest tardis, um, upstroke that we already uh, talked about, um, a thrill, of course, always a, um, your impulse can be sustained, non-displaced, um, because with this aortic stenosis, you're expecting to help LV potentially. Um, an early ejection sound, again, congenital stenosis due to a bicuspid aortic valve will cause something like that. Uh, A2 intensity can be decreased or even absent. Um, and then the P2 component will be paradoxically split, and then you can keep uh, your S4 may be present as well. So here's just a quick little picture about uh, air stenosis and sort of what you start to see here when I was talking about the late peaking, as you can see, it's starting to peak later. And uh, when you get down to severe air stenosis, you see the red portion, which is the aortic valve at E2. Um, it's now paradoxically split and coming after the the P2, and it's getting softer as well. Um, and then Holcomb is good to talk about because we can always contrast the stenosis with Holcomb. Um, the location of the Holcomb uh, murmur is going to be in the left ventricular outflow tract. So because of that obstruction, it's actually best heard along, along the mid and lower left sternal angles, whereas with aortic stenosis, when you're hearing it on the right upper sternal border, that's more of the sort of turbulent flow in the ascending aorta. Um, and the description is uh, going to be harsh murmur. Again, uh, LVOT obstruction can cause it to kind of 
transmit anywhere in the proportium, um, but usually not to the carotid, but here stenosis does. And the intensity and severity are related to the degree of obstruction. Um, so associated findings, yeah. So you can also get a, a, a MR murmur as well uh, that can occur because of uh, uh, the um, <clears throat> systolic anterior motion or SAM of the mitral valve that occurs because of the, the pressure, the negative pressure that's created. Um, and then you have a brisk carotid upstrokes, this sort of spike dome appearance that we talked about. Sustained uh, LV apical impulse again, um, just like uh, aortic stenosis, but with focum, you can expect to see a double or triple thrust. S2 paradoxical and S4 as well. Um, so here we kind of just tr try to distinguish focum and aortic stenosis, and, and these are some maneuvers that we can do. Um, to elicit these changes. And as you can see, when, when you have both them, uh, with Valsalvo or standing, um, when you decrease preload to the heart, the murmur gets harsher. Um, and then with the rapid squatting, which will increase preload back, your murmur actually decreases, uh, whereas the opposite is true of aortic stenosis. Um, the, the reason being is, you know, with aortic stenosis, your murmur is gonna get worse anytime you have increased flow across that valve. So anytime you have increased preload to the heart, um, you're going to have increased flow. So that's why air stenosis gets worse. Whereas with fulcum, when you have increased preload, you actually increase the LV cavity and you uh, decrease the obstruction. Uh, and, and thus the murmur will, will decrease. Uh, next, colonic stenosis. Um, you know, I don't want to spend too much time. I know that we're running out of time here on some of these that are less commonly seen by us, but um, you know, pulmonic area, harsh, crescendo, decrescendo, very similar to your aortic stenosis, um, but it'll radiate to the left shoulder, the back, the lungs. Um, and uh, severity, same thing, just like aortic stenosis, time to peak. Um, you can have increased A wave, um, sternal lift, D, uh, elevated GADP, um, yeah, pretty much it. I don't want to spend too much time on, on this. Uh, very similar um, sort of to uh, aortic stenosis, but what we have here obviously is that the P2 component is going to be uh, more exaggerated and coming after A2 more than you would expect in a normal person and not paradoxical like you would expect in a normal person. Uh, ASD, I spoke about this a little bit earlier. Um, it does create a systolic murmur. The murmur is actually created from um, increased flow through the pulmonic valve. So it actually ends up becoming similar to pulmonic stenosis. Um, there are key differences though that can help you differentiate it. Um, the S2 component will remain unchanged um, because again, the, there's nothing wrong with the pulmonic valve itself, which is what causes the S2 component to be decreased in intensity when you have pulmonic stenosis. Uh, so in an ASD, you may have a normal S2 or it is sometimes you, you can even be um, more intense. And then the splitting as well. You have fixed splitting with ASD Whereas with, um, with pulmonic stenosis, you'll have uh, your P2 component coming in um, significantly after your A2 component. And uh, ASD doesn't change with inspiration. Whereas with inspiration, you'd expect your P2 component to, I mean, um, your pulmonic stenosis, sorry, to uh, worsen. And so just remember flow through ASD and diastolic, because I mentioned that's mm -hmm. uh, flow through the ASD and that flow actually possibly be um, important from the echo standpoint, just for when you're looking at an ASD or looking at the dialysis. Yeah, and again, just nothing changes with inspiration or expiration. Uh, MR, this is pretty important. So um, again, diaphragm, uh, better at the apex, glowing, high pitch. Uh, all your regurgitant systolic uh, murmur is going to be high pitch, and it can radiate to the left axilla, like I mentioned already. Um, you know, uh, it can increase with expiration because with expiration you have increased flow through the left side. So um, you'll have, uh, you know, um, increased flow, uh, increased MR, and then uh, isometric hand grip as well. Um, if you have a posterior leaflet prolapse, um, the jet actually will be anterior. And so your radiation actually could be towards the left sternal border or sometimes even towards the neck rather than the axilla. And then with MVP, you know, like Dr. Heider mentioned, it's not holosystolic, you'll have a click followed by the murmur. Uh, and then when you have uh, acute MR, because of the rapid equalization of pressures, you actually may just get an early systolic murmur, which will then just dissipate. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, Tricuspid regurg. Um, so again, the left lower sternal border, high pitched as well. 
um, may increase with uh, inspiration because you're just having increased flow across the uh, the right side. Um, and it's not always related to the, uh, the severity is not related to the intensity always, but you usually will see an elevated JVP with this. Um, your RV can become severely dilated. And so you may end up having, this is a situation where you may have having a PMI be uh, not your apical impulse. Um, you expect to find a left parasternal lift, um, prominent large B wave, especially um, narrow split S2, even a pulsatile liver or right heart failure sign. Um, BSD is very similar to uh, MRTR. It's just a, a holosystolic murmur. Um, you're expecting this towards uh, the left lower sternal area, uh, and then uh, it'll radiate towards the sternum, uh, not towards the axilla. One way to differentiate it between uh, MR. Um, and uh, you can sometimes get a diastolic rumble, um, and that's just from increased flow across the mitral valve. Something to note. Just the thrill is really important because I mean, I see I'm, I'm a Eastern practice or question, but if this thrill is just because of the high, that's your diagnosis. And, and the, uh, the severity is not always um, uh, proportional to the severity of the defect. You know, so, yeah, so a loud restrictive murmur can actually be a small defect, and, and the opposite is true as well. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pretty big. pretty big, right? Because the equalization happens quickly and you won't get an intense of a murmur yet. Uh, quick, just quick summary about some of these systolic murmurs. Um, I'll just skip just for time. Um, and yeah, so mitral valve prolapse, uh, you know, one thing to note is where you're hearing that initial click, if you are, and then the beginning of the murmur. Uh, and this can change um, kind of similarly to what happens with Volcom. So uh, MVP after sudden standing. So when you stand suddenly, you're decreasing preload. What ends up happening with decreased preload is that um, your LV cavity is not uh, stretching as much. And uh, when that stretch happens, what happens with the mitral valve leaflets is that they actually kind of come in contact a little bit better. Um, uh, so when, when you have decreased preload, you have a smaller cavity and then the prolapse will happen earlier. So with uh, sudden squatting, you have an increase in preload larger LV cavity, they're in contact more, and so the, the prolapse will happen a little bit later. And so that's mm -hmm. why this phenomenon. Um, and then these are the diastolic murmurs. Just gonna move quickly. Mitral stenosis. Uh, again, we already talked about the special position that you wanna um, listen for this murmur. Left lateral decubitus, uh, low pitch. Um, and then, yeah. Uh, OS might be present as well in this uh, the opening snap. And then AFib is common in patients with uh, mitral stenosis. Sorry, I'm moving through these like pretty quick now. Um, <clears throat> so Eric regurgitation, um, blowing high pitch to crescendo, happy murmur, um, radius to the right sternal border. Um, and then uh, it's usually the intensity is related to the severity and the acuity of the lesion. Um, in, in chronic aortic regurgitation, the duration of the murmur is usually associated with severity, but with acute aortic regurgitation, you might hear a brief, sol uh, soft, early diastolic murmur. Um, so it's important to kind of to remember that, that it, you know, if you hear that, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the severity is not, not great. Um, uh, Austin Flint murmur can sometimes be heard as well. It's a low pitch rumbling in an apical area, and then it's a diastolic murmur because of this pre-systolic uh, uh, accentuation, and it can sometimes mimic uh, mitral stenosis. So the big one here, if the AI is the soft SLS, then you see that with the AI, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a device, it's not just a small chunk, but it's not really a device. That's the key, like you see soft SLS, mm -hmm. AI. Yeah, yeah. Um, other things like S3 because of just volume, increased volume, and then laterally displaced hyperdynamic exploding pulses, again, because of this increased LV volume due to AR, um, you're gonna have uh, dilation of the cavity. Um, yeah, and then there's multiple peripheral signs that are associated with this as well. Um, I have them listed here. Some of the ones that I, I come across that are, I think, more a little bit more important. Pinky sign, which is pulsations in the, in the capillaries. Corrigan sign, which is a very brisk and high amplitude pulse, the very brisk downstroke. Um, Demussets, which is the systolic head bobbing that you're going to see the femoral pulses, either you can, you can have retrograde breeze or diastole, or you can have these crystal shot um, uh, sounds that you can auscultate. And then hill sign is very important. If you listen, 
do um, take the blood pressure and the brachial and the femoral. Uh, and then if there's a difference with the, the lower extremity being higher, um, you can help grade the AR based on that. And yeah, again, um, equalization of the two chambers. So if it's very severe, the equalization happens earlier and so your murmur is gonna terminate earlier. Um, pulmonic regurgitation, kind of similar to aortic regurgitation, high pitch, blowing, listen to it in the pulmonary area. Um, very localized, doesn't really radiate much and it increases with inspiration again. Inspiration causes increased flow through the right side, same, same concepts over and over. Um, you can have a loud P2 component, um, persistently split S2, and then you'll have a, you know, elevated JVP uh, as expected. And then you might get RVH because of the constant volume overload, and, and so you can expect the peristernal lift. Uh, tricuspid stenosis. A um, couple of things just to know about this is it's not as low pitched as MS, so we don't have a special sort of position for it. Um, like we do with the uh, stenosis, uh, it's increased with inspiration, um, large A waves, slow wide descent. Um, you can have an opening snap just like you can with microstenosis. Um, yeah, and then much it. PDA, um, continuous, you know, murmur that you're going to hear very harsh, uh, will radiate to the clavicles, machine machine gun-like quality that you know you'll hear or see on test a lot. Um, you can have bounding peripheral pulses, wide pulse pressure, um, you can have cyanosis if there's a right to left shunting that occurs. And this is a quick summary of the diastolic murmurs here. So this I really wanted to get to this, um, the different maneuvers. Uh, we touched on this a little bit. Um, so I, I put the diastolic numbers up first because it's much easier here. Um, so with Valsalva, um, as we know, you know, you have a decrease in preload. So you have basically decrease in flow through a blood flow through the heart. So you're going to have a decrease in all of the intensities of the numbers. Uh, with squatting, you have an increase in, um, in uh, flow through the heart because of increase in, in um, uh, preload. So you're going to have an increase in numbers here. And then with hand grip, you have an increase in afterload. So your regurgitant murmur um, will be increased as well. So this is kind of where um, I think everyone sort of gets tripped up a little bit um, is the systolic murmurs. And there's a lot to know here. Um, with inspiration, again, flow through the right side of the heart is increased uh, and through the left side of the heart is decreased. And so you expect your right side and murmurs to worsen. Um, and your left-sided murmurs to get better, the exceptions being mitral valve prolapse and hokum for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. And uh, for standing, the opposite is, is really true. You know, most of your murmurs are gonna decrease in intensity because you have decreased flow. But again, MVP and hokum get better with increased preload and get worse with decreased preload. It's always important. Same, you know, the opposite is true of squatting. Um, for hand grip, you know, hokum is gonna get better with increased afterload as well. Um, something's not listed here. It's like post PVP. So the murmurs of hokum, air stenosis, and pulmonary stenosis uh, will increase. There's no changes in the murmurs for mitral regurgitation and TR. Um, and then uh, the pulse pressure with hokum will decrease, uh, and then the pulse pressure of air stenosis will increase because it's post PVC. What's that called? Drop and draw. Yeah, I, I used to have an attendee who uh, made a big stink of that. We used to say, oh, well, the pressure gradient increases in the beat after the post CBC beat. And he'd be like, no, you fail. <laughs> it's actually the um, like, it's actually the pulse pressure pulse pressure rate. So it's the distance, same thing as distal and diastole. It's not the pressure gradient. So that's kind of like the image in my head. Um, just a couple more slides now. Just the peripheral exam. Um, I didn't touch too much on this because I think we we'd probably get a lot of uh, exposure to this already, but edema, just don't forget particular edema. I always do for some reason. Um, signs of endocarditis that look for like January lesions, also known as the January lesions. Um, other signs of CHF and then low output states always like feel the extremities, if they're cool, um, things like that. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on was pulsus paradoxus. Um, just because I think it's important for everyone to really know how to do this well. And um, 
you know, you, this is something that we'll use for cardiac camp now, but you can also see false of chronic lung disease. Uh, Greg mentioned this, I think, yesterday a little bit. Um, asthma, PEs, RV failures, you know, lots and lots of different things. And it's, it's a little bit of a misnomer. It's not really a paradox. It's more of just an exaggeration of what your normal inspiratory fall of systolic blood pressure is expected to be. Um, so with inspiration, obviously, you have pooling of blood in your um, pulmonary capillaries as well as uh, the RV, there's increased flow. So you actually have less flow into the LV. And so that's why during inspiration, your, your systolic blood pressures will fall. So in order to do um, pulses paradoxes, you want to, you know, just get a manual blood pressure cuff, inflate uh, to 20 uh, millimeters of mercury above and slowly deflate. Um, you're going to hear that first uh, protocol sound. Um, and you should really only hear it during expiration uh, and not to, and it should disappear during inspiration. So once you have that established, then you slowly decrease until the point where you hear it during both inspiration and expiration. And the difference between that expiratory intent, that's a positive pulse of paradoxes. And um, um, yeah. Do you ask the patient to breathe deeply when you do pulses? No, no just, I, yeah. I mean, if they have real pulses, they probably are yeah. like in a lot of distress. <laughs> But as quietly and normally as you can get them to be. Yeah, it seems you can't hear it in the ER. It's so loud. I'm like, I always say, yeah, it's not because they do nothing, do the same thing. Yeah. And then the paradox is that you don't feel the pulse. Right, right. You don't feel it. I don't feel it. And that's a thank you. Good job. Yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs>